We're joined by CNN's John King, along with the former NATO Supreme Allied Commander, retired General Wesley Clark. Uh, John, the U.S. is deeply concerned that Kyiv, the capital, could fall to the Russians within a few days. Let's walk through it, Wolf. I'll show you why, and also just use the map, the value of the map. You just had that great live reporting from our brave correspondents on the scene. Jim Shudo out here in Lviv, even there, air raid sirens. In Kyiv, the capital under assault. Our Sam Kiley and others have been here. Kharkiv, the second largest city. And a lot today, you see the arrows down here, Wolf. Uh, the scope of this is what tells you the Russians are quite serious. And even though they, you hear from the Pentagon, you hear from the Ukrainians about the resistance, uh, you also hear the Russians are now accelerating their attack on the entire country. This is about the size of Texas. Amphibious infantry, that's the Russian jargon for Marines coming in here, as well as ground troops from Crimea heading up toward the Donbass, some heading toward the city of Kherson as well. And then you move up here. To, so there's fighting down here, and then Kyiv, the capital. Obviously, seizing the state of power would be absolutely critical. I just want to bring us in closer to this. Uh, you remember yesterday, our Matthew Chance said he left Kyiv and went up here to the northwest to Antonov airport. He, air, airport. he ran into troops who identified themselves as Russians. He believed they were special operations forces. It was a back and forth between the Ukrainians and the Russians over who was in charge. But today, the Russian Defense Ministry went public and says it now controls this key airport. Again, you see the proximity to Kyiv. And General Clark, I want to bring you in on that point, just to make the point. This is not your any run-of-the-mill airport. This is an airport with long airstrips where you could land military transport planes. Explain, if the idea is to take the capital of Kyiv, why is that so important? That's right. That's right. I mean, they wanted to hold that airport. They wanted to seize that airport so they could air land uh, paratroops in there and then grab the air, the uh, Kiev and add to the siege that's going in around Kiev. And so, Wolf, you get the, just the sense that's just one of the targets. Uh, General Clark has much broader perspectives about the, what he believes is a dire day. You know, and, and, and a really remarkable move, NATO, for the first time since it was established back in 1949, it has activated what it calls its NATO response force. Tell us about that. So let me bring this up. And then General Clark, of course, once the NATO Supreme Allied Commander can help us with the context. This is, again, if you look at the map from this perspective, all the blue are the NATO countries that surround. And so what has happened? This emergency NATO response force has never been activated to protect NATO countries. It was always used to project force elsewhere. Uh, Hans Stoltenberg, the Secretary General today, saying it will be deployed. It could be up to 40,000 troops. Uh, there are ground troops. There are air and sea assets as well. Not the full force being deployed right now, but Wolf, it's in addition to the troops. We already know the United States and the other NATO allies have sent more troops to Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland. So why is this so important? You see the NATO ring here. Well, look at where Ukraine is. When we started this week, Russia, yes, has a puppet government in Belarus, but here was the line, essentially. So these NATO countries had a buffer, Ukraine. If Vladimir Putin takes Ukraine and that goes away, essentially what you get is 33 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, Vladimir Putin gets to extend perhaps a new Iron Curtain right there on NATO's doorstep. Right, General? That is what you're so concerned about. That's right, John. I am concerned about it. But I'm also concerned about the people in Kyiv. For since really, since Harry Truman provided assistance to Greece fighting a communist insurgency in 1947, the United States has helped countries defend their independence. In Kyiv, we've got 40 million, in, in Ukraine, we've got 40 million people who, who have an independent country. I'm looking at Kyiv itself. It's going to be uh, besieged. It's under artillery fire and so forth. You've got over 2 million people in there. Uh, and the orders that Putin has given apparently is to besiege it and clear it. And that means unquestionably hundreds, maybe tens of thousands of civilian casualties. And for NATO, uh, that's fine. We've activated the reaction force, but we're not going into Ukraine. We're not going to do anything for those people. So in my lifetime, what I've seen is the United States helps nations defend themselves against external aggression. And we're asking, what can we do? The sanctions are great, but what can we do tonight, tomorrow, the next day, to help Ukraine and Ukrainians hold on to their independence and stop the impending slaughter in Kyiv. And Wolf, you can hear from General Clark there again, just to come back to the map of Kyiv. It's between the size of Chicago and Los Angeles. It's nearly three million people, as General Clark notes, uh, not only the seat of government, a giant metropolitan city, the largest city in Kyiv under siege tonight. Well, well let, me, let me ask uh, General Wesley Clark, uh, well, what, what can the U.S. do and the NATO allies? There are 30 countries that are members of NATO right now, what can, what should they be doing to, to save the lives of those thousands of people in Ukraine who potentially the next day or two could be killed? 
Well, that's the question. And um, I think we should go to the United Nations. We should call on Russia to do an immediate halt of its operations. We should declare a safe zone around Kiev and maybe every part of uh, Ukraine west of the Dnieper River, let's say. Tell Russia to halt. Tell them to stop. They don't have the right to do this. As President Biden said, this is illegal. And the sanctions on, on Putin, they're great. But I remember being in the Balkans, and I remember what that hardship was, Wolf, and I probably, and you do too, I'm sure, where slaughter went on for years. 200,000 people were killed, and finally the United States stopped it. We have to stop this.